Right, we seem to be here. So, so uh, just to welcome you all here today, uh, my name is Pat, Pat Gary, and I have the privilege and the pleasure of being able to introduce the talk here today. Um, so, um, this is uh, Mondays at the Mess, and the talk today is uh, Inchi Corps and the Spanish Civil War. Mondays at the Mess is a series of talks run by Richmond Barracks in Inchi Corps that celebrate the rich stories and the experience of the local community, past and present. Richmond Barracks is run by Dublin City Council Culture Company, which runs cultural initiatives and buildings across the city with, uh, for the people of Dublin. Uh, as I said, my name is Pat Gary, and in a few minutes, I'm going to hand you over to tonight's speaker, who's Fergus Whelan. But before I start, I want to let you know that there'll be time at the end for some questions. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we possibly can. This talk is being recorded and will be shared at a later date by all our channels. Uh, if you want to be told what is, when this is available and to find out more about other projects and events, please sign up to our newsletter and I will put in the link at the end of the chat. Our speaker today is Fergus Whelan. Now, Fergus is an author and historian and is based in Dublin. His published books include This Descent into Treason, which was published in 2010, God Provoking Democrat, published by New Ireland Press, in 2015, and May Tyrants Tremble, published in 2020. He holds a Master of Philosophy in my Early Modern History from TCD, and he works as a tour guide at Richmond Barracks and 14 Henry Yellow Street. Now I have the pleasure of handing you over to Fergus. Fergus. Uh, uh, thanks, Pat, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, the title of my talk today is In Chicago, the Spanish Civil War, uh, a comradeship of local heroes. If you ever had the uh, pleasure of going on one of our walking tours from Richmond Barracks down to Kilmaine in jail. Well, if you haven't had the pleasure yet, uh, make sure you uh, make yourself a promise and do it sometime soon. But halfway along that walk on the Emmet Road, you'll see this plaque here. And it says, it reads, this plaque commemorates local volunteers of the International Brigades who fought fascism in Spain in 1936 to 1939. Tony Fox of Golden Bridge Avenue, Mick May, Connolly Avenue, Bill McGregor in Shakar, Paddy McElroy, Nash Street, Joe Monks, Park Street, Bill Scott, Ring Street, No Passeran. Spanish Civil War broke out in July of 1936. And before going into what that was um, that was about, I want to tell you something about the condition, the political situation in Dublin uh, at that time. Uh, in Dublin in July of 1936, when the, the Spanish War broke out, Eamon de Valera uh, was uh, the, he, he wasn't called Taoiseach in those days, he was called President uh, of the Executive, but it was the equivalent of uh, what we would now call Taoiseach today. Um, his government has been in power since 1932 and is very, very popular indeed. And in fact, de Valera went on to win several elections uh, and held power for uh, 16 years consecutively at that time. So his is a very popular government. One of the first things he had to do when he came to power, well, one of the first things he wanted to do, he had to wait a little while before he could actually do it, but he was very anxious to sack the commissioner of the Garda Sea O'Connor, uh, Ono Duffy. Uh, ono Duffy had been uh, in charge of the police force, but De Valera had known that in when it was looking like Fianna Fáil were going to win the election, the coming government would have to democratically hand over power uh, uh, to De Valera, Ono Duffy was conniving at some sort of a military or police coup to prevent the, uh, the democratic transfer of power. So not unnaturally, uh, De Valera decided uh, that he was going to sack him. Uh, after being sacked, he becomes head of the newly formed Fine Gael party. Uh, but he doesn't last long in that line. And he's also head of a fascist type organisation, the Blue Shorts, who in emulation of the Nazis and, and the, the black shirts in Germany, they wore a coloured shirt, gave the straight hand uh, salute and so on. Well, but by the time the war breaks out in 1936, the Spanish war breaks out, uh, the blue shirt movement has, is dead as well. So Duffy's sort of prospects have really fallen. He was head of Fine Gael, expelled from that. Uh, the blue shorts are, are all but finished at this time. Um, the IRA, had helped De Valera to power in the 1932 election. Uh, the IRA was a very large organisation at the time, and they worked very hard uh, uh, to help De Valera get elected. They didn't always behave themselves. One IRA man at the time, a man called Paddy Brown, 
who afterwards was uh, the president of the Bricklayers Union, uh, I knew Paddy. Paddy claimed that in 1932, he voted 46 times for De Valera. So De Valera in 1932 was quite happy with the IRA. He released all the prisoners and he made them once more uh, a legal organization. Uh, however, by 1936, a small group had split away from the IRA, a left-wing group to set up uh, the Republican Congress. Uh, but they again, when they started in 1934, it looked, the prospects looked very bright. It looked like this was a young, bright left-wing party with prospects. But in the normal course of Irish politics anyway, the first thing on the agenda was the split. So they had split at, literally at the first conference in 1934. And they were um, they were on their last legs by the time uh, the Spanish War breaks out. Um, De Valera didn't leave the IRA legal for lo long enough. They kept denying him in different ways. Mostly when they there was a tram strike in Dublin, and the IRA decided they were on the side of the tram workers, uh, and they fired on army lorries that were being used to ferry stranded people to and from work. That Basically, as De Valera said, was the last straw for him. So we banned them again. So they're again illegal by the time the, the Spanish War breaks out. Um, from 1933, in the three years leading up to the Spanish thing, there had been a lot of violence on the streets of Dublin, where just tiny left-wing parties like the Revolutionary Workers Group or the Communist Party, tiny organizations, and probably less tiny, the Republican Congress, Whenever they appeared at public meetings, they would be violently attacked by, um, by basically right-wing Catholic action uh, elements. Uh, and at on one occasion, in fact, the Communist Party probably rather foolishly uh, decided to open an office in, um, in Strand Street in Dublin in 1933. The office lasted all of two weeks when uh, they were, uh, after a, a retreat in the uh, pro-cathedral, a, a mob attacked the officers for three nights on the run, uh, on the trot, and eventually uh, burned the building to the ground. So there's a lot, there's a big history, if you like, of street violence by the right wing Catholic action groups against the tiny left groups. So what was the reaction in Ireland when the Spanish War broke out? Well, first of all, the Irish Independent, the main newspaper at the time, was unashamedly uh, uh, pro-Franco, and anti, uh, anti government. They were always reporting atrocity stories, killings of priests, raping of nuns, burning of churches. And while a lot of these stories were exaggerations, alas, they weren't all exaggerations. There was a lot of anti religious violence in Spain. The, the independent was inclined to blame, not, not inclined, absolutely pinned all this violence on what they called the red government. A lot of this violence did not emanate from the government, it emanated from other anti-church elements in Spanish society. Um, in the, the Irish Independent never referred to um, uh, the government as the government of Spain or the government of the Spanish Republic or the democratic government. They called them the Reds. Franco's side were not called uh, the fascist forces, they were called the patriotic forces. So as far as uh, the independent was concerned. The battle was between the Reds on one hand and the Patriots on the other side. And um, I must, I think it's probably fair to say that the um, that was the outlook of the vast majority of the Irish public at the time as well. And a man calls Paddy Belton, an independent TD. The only reason he was independent was he'd been expelled from the other two parties. He'd been expelled from. Um, Fianna Fáil, and then he was expelled from Fine Gael, but he's an independent TD, and he starts this Irish Christian Front for Spain organization, basically to revive his own um, political fortunes. That photograph that you can somewhat see on the slide, that's um, a mass meeting. I think that was in Cork, but he had these huge rallies in Dublin, Cork, Limerick, in all the major cities in the, the 26 counties. And what the people are doing there, they're doing this. This is a sort of Christian salute that Belton uh, uh, invented to show their solidarity with the Spanish church and their hostility to the Spanish Reds. Um, they, as I said, they have huge meetings in, in, uh, in the major cities with thousands and thousands of people, and they raised 
a very large amount of money to help Franco's rebellion. Now, there were some suggestions that uh, not all of that money uh, actually went to Franco. And in fact, one opponent, as he said, it was a hostile source. He accused uh, uh, Belton of drinking creamy points uh, of Guinness in Madrid uh, with some of the money that had been collected to help uh, General Franco. Um, situation in Spain then. Elements of the Spanish armed forces um, rose in rebellion to overturn the result of an election in February, which had brought a popular front left of centre government to power. Um, the Irish Independent, this is a direct quote from the Irish Independent. San Sebastian has fallen to General Gowa, one of the rebellion's leaders. Gowa maintained that the generals were leading a national effort to save Spain from Marxism, Freemasonry and communism. Now, that sort of rhetoric would have been very, very familiar to the public at large in Ireland at the time, uh, and certainly the Dublin public, because that's exactly the sort of rhetoric that was used by these Catholic action groups when they would be attacking meetings of the, say, Republican Congress um, or, or whatever. Uh, and the Freemasonry, quite frankly, Freemasonry is just called for Protestants. When people wanted to make anti-Protestant statements in the 1930s in Dublin, the badge that you painted your Protestant enemy with was Freemasonry. So when General Gell was fighting Freemasons and Communists, the people of Ireland knew exactly what he was at. And it must be said that the vast majority of people in Ireland uh, were on his side. Um, the Cardinal at the time, Cardinal McCrowley, the Catholic primate of all Ireland, recommended O'Duffy as the best man. He recommended uh, O'Duffy as the best man to lead an Irish brigade to help General Franco uh, in his rebellion. So here we have, uh, uh, O'Duffy is only too glad uh, to uh, raise a brigade. His, his own political fortunes are at a very low end here. So here he has an opportunity to uh, raise a large group of uh, volunteers and go off and be seen to be fighting for God and for religion and for Christianity in Spain. Um, but the newspaper didn't get it all its own. The, the Independent and the other newspapers didn't get it its all its own way because the leftists come up with a, 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 with a good idea. They brought a Basque priest, a Father Laborda, uh, to speak at a public meeting in the Gaiety Theatre in Dublin. Now, Laborda was very well known in Dublin because he was a very fine folk singer. And he'd actually sung at the Eucharistic Congress in 1932. So he was a person who was uh, uh, known uh, in, in Dublin. So um, this is what he said. This is how we behaved at the meeting. And this is what he said. Crossing himself, he then broke into a Basque folk song. He pr proceeded to tell his audience that Franco was not a defender of the Catholic religion. He said he would explain, but not justify, why churches had been born in Spain. Before the election, many churches and services were used by fascist priests for political meetings. He said it is a crime to link Christianity to such a bloodthirsty brute as Franco. The war was not about religion, nor had the recent election been about religion. In the election, the left had beaten the right with votes, and now the right were attempting to beat them with guns. The civil war was an attempt by the rich to overthrow the verdict of the polls and deny the right of the poor and the humble to live under a government chosen by themselves. Fascists had shot Basque priests and workers chanting, Christ the King, long live the Catholic Spain. Laborda was very critical of the Irish clergy. And this is what he said of the Irish clergy. The Irish clergy know I am a priest and an eyewitness to the war. Yet not one single Irish priest has asked me about the war. Why? Because they know of the atrocities committed by Francos against our bishops, priests, women, and the poor of Spain generally. That is why they do not ask. They know it already, but they are the partisans of fascism. So there is pretty harsh criticism from a Catholic priest in relation to his own Catholic priest brethren here uh, in Dublin at the time of the Spanish Civil War. In fact, my father, at the age of 18, was a, um, a steward at the meeting, at, at the meeting, and he often spoke about uh, uh, the time Father Laborda came uh, to Dublin. But he didn't know until 50 years after the meeting had taken place that Laborda's life was, it was not welcomed here by the Irish government, and the Irish government more or less deported him back to Spain. He was eventually captured by Franco's troops and he was executed. So my father didn't realize that 
the man he had sort of helped on his movement all the rest of it, ends up uh, being uh, executed by General Franco. It has to be said that Franco executed thousands and thousands and thousands of people, both during uh, 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 and uh, after uh, uh, the war. The executions were going on up in, on to the 19, well into the 1940s. The war was supposed to have ended in 1939. Um, just going back to O'Duffy. O'Duffy, as it said, his political career was sort of in ruins here. And the, the, he had wanted to go. He was looking for a way out earlier when Mussolini attacked Abyssinia in 1935. Totally illegal invasion, absolutely against all the rules of international law. The Abyssinians had done nothing on uh, uh, the Italians or Mussolini. He simply invaded because he thought he could take the country over because he had the military might uh, to do so. But uh, Duffy was anxious to help uh, Mussolini and he offered to bring a brigade over to Abyssinia. Now, um, Mussolini didn't need his help. Mussolini had plenty of airplanes, plenty of uh, uh, artillery pieces, plenty of mustard gas. He had everything he needed to be able to pound the unfortunate Abyssinians into um, into uh, surrender. So, uh, although he didn't get his chance, but he got his chance when the Spanish War uh, comes and he decides uh, that he's going to raise an Irish brigade. And he claims that within the first week, 7,000 people had volunteered to accompany him to Spain. He brought, in the end of the day, he brought 700, 750 men with him. Um, these were not, although obviously some of the officers were experienced soldiers and had been through the civil war, perhaps in the Free State Army. The vast bulk of these were very young men from very, very poor backgrounds, unskilled men, men who had no trade, very little employment prospects, and would have known very little about what was going on in Spain, except perhaps what they heard from the pulpit. When they go to Mass on a Sunday, the Masses in Dublin in those days on a Sunday would be packed Mass after Mass. The whole thing would be in Latin. The sermon would be in um, English. It's doubtful that these type of very poor inner city boys would have been reading the Sunday Independent that was really designed, or that Irish Independent that was designed for the Catholic middle classes. So the chances are they got their information on Spain from the pulpit. Uh, and in the words of Christy Moore, the bishops blessed the blue shorts down in Galway as they sailed beneath the swastika to Spain. Well, they certainly did. Christie is right. They did sail in a German ship, so they did sail beneath the swastika. However, I'm told it was two curates rather than two uh, bishops who blessed the blue shorts down in, down in Galway. The only person I could identify from the Inchicore area that was on that, that sailed under the swastika, was a young man called Thomas O'Brien from Kelly's Cottages, uh, James Street. He's the only one from the area that I know of, and I don't really know much about. They had they didn't see much action over there. They weren't over there for very long and they didn't have many casualties. So, so uh, hopefully we can assume that young Thomas O'Brien came back to Kelly's cottages safe and well after his, and probably back to the same sort of poverty that he left. <clears throat> um, on the other side, well, the vast majority of the Irish people supported Franco. There was a small group of people, mostly left-wingers, some of them communists, some of them IRA men, most of them trade unionists, um, uh, who um, went with just under 200 men of the uh, International Brigade, went over to fight for the democratic government. They had to go surreptitiously. Most of them couldn't even tell their uh, uh, parents. They, they had great difficulty getting passports. The Irish government didn't want to make it easy for them to go. It was okay for O'Duffy could um, sail out with his, under the swastika with no obstacle, but lots of obstacles were put in the way of the people who wanted to volunteer for uh, the other side. <clears throat> Tony Fox from Golden Bridge Avenue was a section leader of, of the 4th Battalion of the IRA. My own father was a member of, the, of his section, and he called to see my father in his house in Van Borb Street on the 10th of December, 1936. He told Paddy that he was going, uh, the IRA was going nowhere and he wanted to fight fascism. He left the following day, he left Dublin on the 11th of December, 1936, crossed the Pyrenees on the 15th, and he was killed at the Battle of Lepero 
on the 28th of December. In other words, poor old Tony Fox didn't even last a fortnight uh, in Spain. Uh, he, and of course, his body uh, was never recovered. Um, Mick May, 1916, 1936, lived at 35 Con uh, Connolly Avenue uh, in Shakur. Um, he was a 4th Battalion member of the IRA and a member of the Communist Party. He travelled to Spain with Frank Ryan and Tony Fox. He was killed at the Battle of Lepero on the, the same day as Tony Fox. Battle of Lepero took place on the Cadoba front. He was last seen firing his rifle, uh, uh, covering his retreat and comrades. Uh, his body was never recovered. They were the first two Irish men to die as members of the International Brigade uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Liam McGregor, 1914 to 38. He was from 68, Kickham Road, Kilmainham. He was the son of Esther McGregor, a tenants leader and communist activist. The biggest, one of the biggest problems besides bad pay and bad working conditions, the biggest problem that workers in Ireland and in Dublin had specifically in the 1930s was appalling housing conditions. Uh, Esther McGregor was well, a well-known champion a tenants leader and well-known champion of tenants rights. She, in other words, she helped in many, many a battle against slum landlords to improve uh, the conditions or to reduce the rent uh, of, uh, of working people. So that made her a very popular figure in Dublin. However, when she stood for election as a, for the Inchicore area as a communist candidate, she got something like 120 votes then as now, there's not really many votes in communism in uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, anyway, uh, Liam, her son, uh, was expelled from the 4th Battalion of the IRA for joining the newly formed Communist Party in 1939. Uh, he attended the Lenin School in Moscow. Um, the communists in Moscow basically had a university where they would pick young men what they considered ta ta the talented young men from all over Europe and beyond and bring them to Moscow to educate them in the communist road to revolution and so on. So uh, uh, young McGregor is in Moscow when uh, his education, if you want to call it that, uh, is um, interrupted by the Spanish Civil War. And he, uh, he sent, uh, he joins the International Brigade and he's killed at the Battle of the River Elbro on the 22nd of the 7th, 1938. He died alongside Jack Nalty of Fairview. You'll hear a little bit more about Jack Nalty in a minute. And he has a posthumous citation for bravery on the battlefield. Um, I love this photo. I got this photo after I first uh, put this presentation together from a, um, a niece of Paddy McElroy. Paddy was from... Uh, 20 Nash Street in Shakar. Uh, he's there with a couple of Waterford men. And uh, the black man there on the side is a fellow called Walter Garland from the United States. Uh, unfortunately, whoever put the wording on the photo got Paddy McElroy's name wrong. They have him down as uh, Paddy McAvoy. But another person in that is um, Peter O'Connor of Waterford. Now, probably the preeminent, or certainly one of the preeminent uh, historians, Irish historians of the Spanish Civil War is actually uh, Emmett O'Connor of uh, the University of Ulster. Emmett is the son of Peter O'Connor. And when I got that photograph, I, I asked Peter, Peter, had he seen it? He'd seen the photograph, but he didn't, he, had, he hadn't seen, he hadn't seen the names uh, or the citations or whatever below. So that, that was a little treasure that I'm very, very grateful to. Um, in Esau Paddy's for uh, sending me. Anyway, Paddy's a member yet again of the 4th Battalion uh, of the IRA. Uh, his brother Christopher had fought in the fort, with the 4th Battalion under Eamon Kant in 1916. So it's to be presumed that here's another connection, if you like, with Richmond Barracks. The chances are uh, that Christopher uh, was brought to, um, along with Eamon Kant, brought to uh, Richmond Barracks after the uh, surrendered in 1916. But Paddy himself served six months in the glass house in the Curra. Now, the last time I made this presentation, people were fascinated to know what the glass house in the Curra was. So I should explain it. The Curra, as you know, or you probably know, um, 
when you're not talking about the race course, you're talking about a huge, big Irish Army installation down there. Well, in the middle of the installation, there's a very unpleasant punishment house uh, for soldiers. It's ba- it was basically an old military prison, and it's called the Glass House, even though I don't think there's a pane of glass in it. Uh, but um, Paddy was sent there when the, the, the time the, um, the IRA intervened in the tram strike in 1935. Also, he got six months there. Also, Bill Scott and Jack Nalty. We'll be hearing a bit more about Bill Scott in a minute. They got six months. Scott and Nalty, as we still see, would later fight in Spain. Nalty was killed there in November 1938. Also arrested with them that time, but he didn't go to Spain. It was the famous Leo Bordock. He had the best fishing ships in Dublin uh, now and then. So he was, he was among the long list of people who did six months in the glass house in 1935 over the tram strike but uh, um, happily uh, Leo didn't go to Spain and, and didn't come to harm there. Paddy McElroy was seriously wounded at, at the Battle of Harama and repatriated to Ireland in 1937. Joe Monks 16, 16 Park Street in Shakur, again a member of the uh, 4th Battalion um, I think I mentioned earlier on, I did, I mentioned earlier on that the, uh, when the Communist Party tried to open their office, uh, the crowd from the, uh, the retreat or the serenity came up and rioted for three days. Well, one of the few defenders of Connolly House that time uh, was uh, uh, Joe Monks. Um, he, he, he had gone, before the Spanish War broke out, he'd gone to London uh, looking for work. Uh, and he met up when the, the other lads were sneaking, as they were, smuggling their way over uh, to Spain. They went through London and uh, uh, Joe Monks met up with them there and they proceeded uh, uh, on to across the Pyrenees. Uh, and uh, he was at the Battle of Lepero where Tony and Fox uh, were, were wounded or were killed, sorry. And he was badly wounded himself. He has left us a very, very graphic memoir of his time in the Spanish Civil War. It's called With the Reds and Antilatia. And it's available um, It's available online. So all you have to do is Google uh, With the Reds and Antilatia and you'll get a very, very good uh, description of uh, uh, what it was like for the young lads in the International Brigade that time. Uh, of the 13 Irish men who crossed the frontier from France with Frank Ryan on the 14th of December, Sorry, that should be the 15th of December. Six had been killed uh, or died uh, uh, of their wounds. They were Frank Conroy, Anthony Fox, Leo Green, Mick May, Mick Nolan, and uh, t- uh, t- Thomas Woods. So they're actually, they're actually the words. That's how um, Joe Monks described the, the casualties at the Battle of La Pera. It, it, it's not quite accurate, but it's, it certainly gives, it's accurate enough to give you the, the idea about just how high these uh, uh, these casualties were. I mean, the six fellas on the um, on the plaque, three of them were killed, and the three who weren't killed were wounded, and at least one of them was wound, w- wounded more than once. Uh, 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 Willie B. Scott or Bill Scott uh, was wounded uh, on two different occasions. Uh, he was born in in uh, 1908, and he lived until 1988, and he lived in um, for the time in 17 Ring Street in Shakur. He was from a um, Protestant working class family, uh, and, and was a bricklayer by trade. His father, William Scott, had been in the Irish Citizen Army and fought at the College of Surgeons with um, uh, in 1916. Uh, I would have assumed that if that was the case, that would have been another connection with Richmond Barracks. Uh, in a, but in fact, a relative has told me, relative of um, Alan Scott, a relative of Bill Scott, has told me a much more interesting story. Um, uh, Bill Scott was, William Scott was wounded. Well, he broke his leg or he hurt his leg anyway in a fall in the College of Surgeons. So he didn't end up in Richmond Barracks. He was taken around and hidden out in the Bricklayers Hall. Uh, which is just around the car, which was just around the corner of the College of Surgeons in uh, Coast Street. Um, s- strange to say that there was a family living in the Bricklayers Hall at the time, the family of the General Secretary of the Union, Bowen Coldhurst, who in the course of Easter week was actually, or uh, 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 Richard O'Carroll, who in the, uh, in the 
in a few days, within a few days of Easter, we had actually been um, shot dead, murdered in effect by uh, a deranged British officer called Bowen Coldhurst. So here we had um, Bill, Bill William Scotts hiding out uh, with the family, not knowing that the head of that family had already been shot dead by uh, by Bowen Coldhurst. Um, the young Bill, going back to the young Bill, um, he is in the 4th Battalion. He does six months in the glass house along with uh, Paddy McElroy and Jack Nalty. He was the first Irish man to volunteer for Spain. That arose because he was actually in Spain. There, there was a, a left-wing Olympics going on in Barcelona when the war broke out. So he was actually on the ground uh, uh, at the time that the, the, the hostilities began. And he joined a German unit of the International Brigade and fought for the early part of the war uh, uh, with, uh, with the Germans. Uh, he was wounded and he came back, uh, he was wounded in the, the neck and he came back with Frank Ryan, uh, who, came, who himself came back for a few weeks uh, to recuperate from his wounds, but both of them returned to Spain, Frank Ryan to be captured and eventually die in German custody. And... Uh, 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 Bill Scott uh, was badly wounded in the leg, which was a problem for him because uh, uh, he was a bricklayer by trade and that involves having to um, uh, climb onto scaffolds and climb ladders and so on. So it made the rest of his working life particularly difficult, very hard thing to do to climb a, a ladder, climb onto a scaffold uh, with a badly damaged uh, leg. So that's mostly the story of them. I suppose usually I um, finish up uh, with a couple of... Uh, words from the song so we might as well do that now let's see how's it go this song is a tribute to frank ryan kit conway and dinny cody too peter daly charlie regan and new bonner though many died i can but name a few danny boyle blazer brown and charlie donnelly liam tomlinson jim strainy from short strand jack nalty tommy patton I'm Frank Conroy, Jim Foley, Tony Fox, and Dick O'Neill. Viva la Quinta Brigada, no passer on the pledge that made them fight. Adelante was the cry around the hillside. Let us all remember them tonight. That banner is a banner of the International Brigade, unveiled during the war. It can be seen down in Collins Barracks. Uh, and if you want to see where the plaque is, it's here. This is on this is a uh, Senate court on Emmett Road. That little dark thing at the side of the pink building is the plaque that you saw slightly enlarged at the beginning. So um, back to you, Pat. And obviously, if there's any questions, I'll endeavour to answer them. Look, Fergus, that was absolutely riveting, uh, absolutely incredible uh, thing. We've uh, a few. Uh... Uh, comments here, uh, but just as from a personal point, I just thought it was absolutely just riveting. Like you know, I mean, you learn so much and something like this, and in such a short time, you covered so much. It was absolutely incredible. So just go, huh? Uh, oh yeah, I did just a comment here. Uh, thank from Beverly. Uh, uh, thanking you for your uh, for the love the song, love to hear more. A fantastic talk and. Uh, then there's a question here. Did the Irish government ever denounce Franco? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good uh, uh, question. And uh, uh, for, for, from, from the beginning, the former government, the Cumann and Gael, the now Fine Gael, the Fine Gael party and so on, and the Christian Front and Arduffy and all them, they're all demanding immediately the rebellion starts, that they recognise Franco and they de-recognise and they stop their trade with the uh, with the Reds, as they call them, to Devil Lear's credit, he wouldn't do that. He, he, he as far as he was concerned, uh, the uh, the government, the elected government, were, were the proper government of Spain, and he didn't uh, he didn't uh, uh, de-recognize them. What they did do, though, both the French, the English, and the Irish governments, and many of the governments around the world, they came up with this idea of the non-intervention pact. And that was supposed to mean that uh, you didn't take sides with either part. That's one of the reasons why, uh, it, it, strictly speaking, uh, De Valera should have stopped Adolfi from going under the, under the, the uh, but he, he didn't do that either. But in a, an actual fact, that non-intervention pact um, 
destroy the Republican government because the Republican government couldn't import arms. The British wouldn't give them any arms. The French wouldn't give them any arms. Well, the Germans and the Italian fascists were pouring weapons and, and uh, even, for instance, the Condor Legion, the, the Nazis, uh, <coughs> um, Air Force was used to destroy places like Gornica and all the rest of it. So the non-intervention pact, which was supposed to be a neutral thing, was actually, it ended up being pro-Franco. But De Valera never explicitly uh, uh, denounced Franco, but he behaved reasonably well in terms of, he recognised the Republican government until it was all over. Brilliant. Now, this uh, another thank you. Uh, was there much information on what was happening in Spain before Franco brought the Moors from Africa uh, yes. into the war? Yeah, to get the wall going. One, one of the things, one of the things that's um, has amazed me when I started researching this is that um, most of the information of what was coming, what was going on in Spain, what was going on in Russia, and what was going on in Mexico was coming through the church. The church were constantly having sermons, retreats, and all the rest, of, warning that Spain was becoming godless and that the Reds were taken over there, and they'd already taken over in Russia, and they were taken over in Mexico. So there was, qu and there was quite a lot of information uh, available about, it was very distorted information, but there, there, there was there was scarce stories about what was going on in Spain uh, for a very long time before the war broke out, and long before Franco ever um, uh, invaded with the Moors. And one of the things I say to the credit, if you like, of the Irish people in the 1930s, they weren't as insular as we sometimes think. It would appear that uh, people were well informed, uh, albeit a lot of what they were being informed of was propaganda, but nonetheless, people, and they did take an interest. Brilliant. Now, this is from um, Tony, Tony McGrath, and it's again, thank you for the great talk. And he says, my particular interest is in the memorial and commemorations. Uh, the Spanish Civil War is intriguing regarding memorials. And if you had any thoughts or opinions regarding the memorialization of those who fought on both sides in Spain. Michael Lahan's plaque near Kilgarvan was the first to be was the first to the International Brigadier and was not erected until 1989. Any thoughts as to why 50 years after the war? And I'll just finish off, uh, we can go back to that in a minute. Uh, based on upon International Brigade, Brigade Memorial Trust, there are 46 memorials to the International Brigade in Ireland, and there were 230 volunteers and 59 deaths. There were 700 in the Duffy Brigade with eight deaths, but only three, remor three memorials, including the memorial to O'Duffy in Monaghan, which was recently put up and taken down. Why so many? And again, many thanks. Do you have any thoughts on that, Fergus? I don't really know. I mean, I, 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 Tony obviously knows a lot more about the subject of memorials than I do. Uh, I, I had no idea there was, there was that many of them um, around. It's and I thought, for instance, that the I didn't I didn't I hadn't heard about the Duffy controversy. Um, our colleague Donald Fallon recently told me that the one memorial he's aware of to the uh, Irish Brigade side, the Duffy side, is to Gabriel Lee in the uh, in the Pro Cathedral. That was put up very much at the time when um, the, um, the when the war was still current news. You know, in other words, it was put up fairly shortly after. Gabriel Lee was um, uh, uh, killed. Uh, he was buried in Spain, but they had a special mass for him in the Pro Cathedral at the time of his death. But, and all the Senegal politicians turned up a lot and still wearing their um, uh, their blue shorts. But it's, I'm, 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 I'm intrigued as to why, ever, like for instance, um, I might get into trouble for saying this, but there's a, there's a memorial um, to the in the Irish, in Potisipto, which used to be the Irish Transport Union uh, uh, headquarters in, in Liberty Hall, to fellows who fell in the International Brigade. But the Irish Transport Union's record in relation at the time to the Spanish Civil War, they weren't particularly pro. A lot of the unions here weren't particularly, some more, the English based unions tended to be more pro the, the, the Republican government. So a lot of people, um, it's, it's somehow the Civil War has become. The International Brigade has become fashionable. Again, maybe the Ken Loach film helps. So now maybe it's just um, some some wars become fashionable at certain times. I, I, I just don't know. But Tony knows a lot about, about the memorials than I do. Yeah, there's a huge amount of information there. Uh, it's nearly, it could be a talk in itself. Uh, and then is this another question here uh, from Michael Riley? 
Uh, great presentation again. Uh, is the Irish government doing anything to recover the bodies of those who fell in the Lopera battle? As I understand that the Spanish government are opening some common graves. You don't know anything is no, anything no, happened there? I, I, I doubt. I, I doubt it. Um, no, I, uh, I don't. I don't. I haven't heard of anything, but I would. I would. I would very, very much doubt it. And again, it's a different thing. I mean, if you, if you're sort of investigating an atrocity, say for instance a mass grave, and I can tell you, Franco's forces met, left plenty of them behind them. That's a different thing than a battlefield. I mean, a, a battlefield with, there's going to be hundreds of men sort of dying on the battlefield, and there'll be no way of there'll be no way after this time of. Uh, um, that I could think of that you could locate bodies after at this amount of time, you know. Uh, this uh, many of the volunteers had to check in with Moscow, and Stalin would give instructions, even when the war was going on in Spain. How did the Irish volunteers react to that? This is from Noel Roach. Is that did that happen? Uh, 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 something like that happened. Yeah, and there, there's just there's some. It's not. It wasn't quite like that. For instance, the common turn controls recruitment into the brigade, right? So, for instance, the Communist Party of Ireland uh, could say yeah, that person is suitable. That's it. Wouldn't go as far as Stalin, right? It'd be, it'd be, a, and the fe the fellow who did that job uh, in um, in D Dublin was uh, uh, the, dare I say the great Bill Gannon. Bill Gannon had been Bill Gannon had been a member of Michael Collins's squad in the in the War of Independence. Afterwards, uh, he was one of. It's now generally accepted. He was one of the people who assassinated uh, Kevin O'Higgins, one of the three fellows who assassinated Kev Kev Kevin O'Higgins, the Minister for Justice in 1927. But by 1936, he's the person who, if you like the common turn, is, uh, says clears people for Spain. Now, I'll tell you a, a, a story I came across recently that quite shocked me, uh, uh, is that Bill Scott, another guy we, we named there, we named it with Bill, Bill Scott, as I said, went with the Germans, right? Uh, I fought with the Germans in Spain. After the war is over, a lot of those Germans, uh, those Germans had initially come to Spain via Moscow because they'd run away from Hitler to Moscow and then they were sent from Moscow to fight for this, the Republican government. And they fought, and Bill Scott uh, 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 fought alongside them. At the time that Hitler of the Hitler-Stalin pacts, they were basically given up to the Germans. Uh, and Bill Scott resigned from the Communist Party over that because he couldn't stomach the idea that uh, the fellas he'd fought, the comrades he'd fought alongside and all the rest of it, were basically handed over to our enemies. And being handed over meant that that was the end of them. But he rejoined the Communist Party, funnily enough, in 19... Uh, 41 when the Soviet Union was invaded. That was the sort of, uh, uh, but so there was there was a lot of um, nasty things done, uh, and um, Stalin's fingerprints are on uh, 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 are on a lot of it. Not so much him personally, but the the, the, the system and the the, uh, the, com the commentary. You know, uh, th there's a question here again about the the position of the trade unions. Where you said that they weren't generally in. Uh, in support of, were they not? That was the... Well, it, it, here's the thing, right? If you, like, the unions in England were all absolutely in favour of the Spanish Republic, right? But the unions in Ireland, where the vast majority of the members of the union uh, were Catholics, and were going to Mass on a Sunday, and hearing that that Spanish government was a priest murdered, non raping church born in government, uh, so the, the individual members of the union would often object to any support or help or whatever been given uh, to church burners, you know. And, and, and one, of the, the, one of the things about trade unions is, for good or ill, they're democratic bodies and they have mm. to do what the members tell them, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, that's it. But the people are looking for resources and we'll, uh, you know, apart from Reds under the bed, re or with the Reds in Andalusia, uh, we look oh, for yeah, the resources. Okay. Uh, this one, this one, uh, it's called In Spanish Trenches. By Barry McLaughlin and Emmett O'Connor. Um, this one is fighting for the Spanish Republic in Spain by uh, by uh, Barry McLaughlin. Uh, and uh, there's Fergal McGarry. Um, I should have put these on the slide. Actually, sorry about that. Uh, Irish po Irish politics and the Spanish Civil War by um, uh, Fergal McGarry. So there's plenty of reading around. And of course, there's a wonderful book on 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 the. International Brigade um, 
as well. This one, it's called uh, the, the International Brigade's Fascism, Freedom and the Spanish Civil War by Giles Tremlett. So you could be reading about the Spanish Civil War from, here, from now till Tim's Eve, if you want it. It does, absolutely. And is it true, just as a matter of interest, that the records are all in Moscow, are they? Um, yes. And Emmett O'Connor, who speaks Russian, uh, as far as I know, and Barry McLaughlin, both of them friends of mine, were certainly, Barry's a friend and, and Emmett's an acquaintance, close to a friend. Both of them went in, uh, got access to, and um, a lot of the new work they've uncovered comes from the common ten records on the International Brigade, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm wrapping up now, Fergus, and I can thank you for a really interesting uh, talk and a presentation. The uh, the comments here are fantastic, and uh, people want to sign up, and they certainly want, they don't feel they've had enough today, which is always a good sign, like, you know. Mm -hmm. So, again, thank you. And um, just uh, to let you know um, what else is happening in the within the Dublin City Culture Club, um, we'll have a newsletter that's available go online and uh, we have our website it's richmondsbarracks.ie and uh, we've got a number of social media channels uh, we hope to see uh, joiners for other things in the near future as well as mondays at the mess we run several other events and programs you might be interested in including tea time talks a series of talks that celebrate the stories of over 300 years of dublin's history at 40 and henrietta street there's the culture club a series of hosted talks and tours that introduce and encourage people to connect with the cultural space in the city. We have the National Neighbourhoods, uh, a year-round programme that creates ways for people to see and make culture in their play place uh, with people they know. And you can find out about all these through our newsletter and uh, through our website. So again, thank and, you uh, all. Pat, 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 don't forget the walking tours. The walking tours, yeah, I can't forget the walking tours because I absolutely love the walking tours. So we have walking tours around Golden Bridge Cemetery, uh, Friday, Saturday and Sundays. Uh, we also have walks from uh, Richmond Barracks down to Kilmainham. Uh, both of these walks take just slightly over an hour and they can be booked online. And uh, we also have the walks from uh, North Inner City, the Georgian Pearl that is a uh, the north in our city from Henrietta Street and we take you through the Gardner Estate, we take in uh, Dublin's oldest Georgian Street, oldest Georgian Square, only Georgian Square and uh, back around to O'Connell Street. So if you get a chance to join us again, thank you for being here today and looking forward to talking to you all again soon. Thank you.